If you are someone dealing with an avoidant partner or a breakup, then I'm sure you've heard at least one YouTube coach tell you that your anxious behaviors are simply too much. When you hear a message like this over and over again, it does make you begin to feel like you're going a little crazy because your dismissive avoidant never seemed overwhelmed at the beginning of the relationship. You could share hard subjects with them and they acted supportive. But nevertheless, all these coaches tell you that every time you text your DA, well, you're just too impatient. My goodness, you're practically out of control. But wait, is this some kind of a trick? Whose behavior is more out of control here? The anxious person who simply wants a face-to-face -face talk about a relationship issue or to be able to ask why the person they love is breaking up with them or the person who tricks people who love them into thinking that yes, they also would like a future with them right before they throw a live grenade into that unsuspecting person's world and suddenly becoming too busy to even bother to find out whether or not they survived the deafening blow. The good news is you can survive it. Hello friends, my name is Maria and I'm no stranger to online coaches, friends, or family trying to trick me into thinking that my anxious behavior is too much for this world. Everyone always tells us what we are doing is wrong. Well, I would argue that anyone who could keep a straight face while throwing that live grenade into a perfectly good relationship, well, Let's just say there's a reason why in the movies it's stereotypically the villain who blows up everything behind them and walks away without a care, never bothering to look back at the destruction that they have caused. This is what bad guys do. And I don't know about you, but I am tired of the world trying to gaslight me into thinking that caring about somebody who claimed to care about me in return is absurd behavior that must be stopped. So if you are tired of avoidant attachment tricks and you're ready for relationship treats, then grab a bottle of nail polish and let's talk. In the last episode, I briefly touched on a question from a viewer that I thought was a good one. He went through a traumatizing, blindsiding breakup with an avoidant woman who dumped him over a text message, and he wants to know, how the heck are you supposed to trust anyone that you date after going through something like that? I first want to say that sometimes the red flags can be so subtle that we damn near miss them. or. We miss them completely, and it's not until a while after the breakup we've had a chance to heal and look back and go over the other person's actions, and you're kind of like, oh. To give you an example, I once met a dismissive avoidant for dinner, and this was probably about our third or fourth time that we were meeting together, and I was running late. And when I got there, I made a joke like, oh, what would you have done if I just didn't show up and I was just kind of, you know, joshing around with him and with it completely pan faced. He looked back at me and was like, I would have been fine. And I laughed because to me, that kind of response was totally absurd. There was no way he actually meant that, especially the way he had been love bombing me the first couple of weeks. No, he was telling me the truth. He was fine in life without me, unless he was just tricking himself because a lot of times avoidance out of fear, they will convince themselves that you are deeply flawed and they are better off alone. Don't let the talking heads on YouTube try to trick you into thinking that you are too much when there's a reason that so many avoidance end up orbiting or trying to get back together with you years later. Everyone craves human connection and they are the ones fooling themselves. So how do you trust again after you've been tricked and gaslit by an avoidant? Well, it helps to surrender to two main ideas. The first idea is you can never control anyone except yourself. And the second idea is life equals risk and uncertainty, and you will never get away from that. 
all decisions you're going to make at the beginning of your relationships, they're all going to be based on incomplete data and an incomplete picture of who this person really is. We don't really know anybody when we first meet them. But unless you're just willing to give up and never leave your house ever again, life pushes forward and it forces you to make decisions based on whatever data you have in front of you in that moment. So what I would tell you is try not to focus on an exact perfect outcome and focus more on the direction that you would like your relationships to go. You know, is this relationship heading in the right direction? Because I want a serious boyfriend and he tells me that I'm fantastic, but it's been two months and he hasn't introduced me to any of his friends or family. You know, people can hide their intentions with you and who they really are for a little while. So it's important to become comfortable with a degree of uncertainty. It's also important that you build the trust with yourself. So when the time comes, this person shows you their true intentions and who they really are, because let's face it, if you stick around people long enough, it will be revealed. You have to trust yourself enough to know that if they reveal something about themselves that does not resonate with you and you know it will not be good for you in the long run, you know that because you cannot control anyone else, you have the courage to change your direction. You build this trust in yourself by, you start with saying no to small things and then you begin to work your way up. Just for example, I once went on a handful of dates with a guy and I knew he had told me that he was a pretty big introvert, uh, so he didn't hide that about himself. But I noticed that after the first couple dates we went on, I realized he was only going out with me because he thought that's what I wanted to do, but he really didn't like that kind of social behavior and he really didn't enjoy crowds and music. And if it was up to him, we would just stay in all the time. And after a while, he did start asking me, even, even when I was all dressed up and ready to go out, he'd be like, hey, would you care if we just stayed in tonight? I'm tired or I don't feel like being around a crowd. And it very quickly became a pattern. Now I knew that it, it was real. it was nothing against him as a person, but we just enjoyed two different lifestyles. And I knew that in the long run, the relationship wouldn't work out. You know, dating scenarios don't have to always end because of some kind of drama or trauma induced fear. Just work out what you would like in your dating life and then start standing up for the small things. Say no thank you to the kind of people who make you feel bad with their backhanded compliments or say no thank you to the kind of people who take three days to text you back. Know yourself well enough to know what kinds of behaviors are going to be too triggering when it comes to keeping your inner peace in the long run and politely decline to go any further. When you get to a point in your dating life where the other person's intentions become clear and you know that uh, it's not going to work, the intentions are not what you're looking for in a relationship, and even though it sucks and even though you don't want to, you are perhaps for the first time in your entire life able to pull the plug on that relationship and walk away, it is the most empowering feeling. And on top of that, because, you know, in the background, you've been busy healing, strengthening your social circle, strengthening your family connections, maybe doing some volunteer work, maybe getting into a fitness routine, maybe getting a new, uh, a couple of new exciting hobbies. When you see that you can walk away from someone and still be okay, you become more unstoppable towards your relationship goals and you build self-respect and trust in yourself. Hey, you did the hard thing once, you can do it again. When you become someone who can do what's best for you while still respecting others and not crapping all over the people around you, <laughs> that's how you know you're healing. Now, on the other side of the anxious coin, I do get questions from people that I'm, I'm sure a lot of anxious people ask this question, including me at one point. What do I do on the day that my avoidant ex actually reaches out to me? Me personally, I don't worry about any of these future scenarios because I know with certainty that future Maria 
well, she'll know exactly how to handle it. I promise you, just, just as sure as I sit here, that at some point, another one of my exes will eventually try to sneak their way back into my DMs like nothing ever happened. But I can also say that I trust myself not to do anything to allow these jokers to come into my world. And that's how you have to think of it. This is your life. They're coming into your space. This is your world. I'm not going to let them come into my world and begin to emotionally push me around. I've made my boundaries in advance. I've already thought about scenarios like that and decided that I'm not going to clown around with it. So if that scenario ever happens, I'm going to respond with my boundaries and not react with my emotions. And as an aside, in case no one's ever told you this, just because your ex messages you or claims to have changed or says that they want you back, you are under no obligation to give them an answer right away. And it's probably better if you don't. But even if you never hear from your dismissive ex ever again, don't let that trick you into thinking that you did something wrong simply by wanting to connect with somebody. And back to what I was saying about, you know, if you're in a place where you're still asking, oh, it's my birthday in a couple of months. What do I do if my ex reaches out? Just know that there's nothing wrong with asking questions. And if you do have a question or you'd like my uh, encouragement or specific brand of advice on your relationship situation, I do have a Patreon and you're always welcome to come visit me. I'll link to that down below. But I will say if you are still in that kind of a place, it means that you are not comfortable with life's uncertainty. You're still coming from a place of fear and you're just not quite healed and over the breakup yet. You haven't built up a certain level of trust with yourself yet and that's okay. You know, I had a viewer in the comments last week and they put it so beautifully. This is a process. You're going to have good days and bad days. Show yourself some grace. Treat yourself with some kid gloves. You will get through this and you will be okay. You know, that viewer got through it. I got through it and it means you can get through it too. It is very important that you are kind to yourself and forgive yourself because you aren't the one who ever meant to hurt yourself. And you know what? A lot of red flags, we simply do not see them. I What's that old saying? You can't see red flags when you're wearing rose-colored glasses. And did you know that if you have a history of trauma and relationships, the red flag, you can actually have something that's called trauma blindness. And I'll go ahead and link a video that discusses that, as well as a few red flags I've missed along the way down in the description below. I've got another way of looking at things for you, which surprisingly helped me with a scarcity mindset. And it helped me not get so attached to people who weren't treating me very well. And that is not seeing my attachment wound as a flaw, but as a part of me and a part of who I am. And in a weird way, a bit of a superpower, because if you can love and attach to one person, then no matter what happens in that relationship, you can love and attach to someone else because that's your attachment. It is part of who you are. Don't get caught up in this you know, scarcity mindset where you are tricked into believing that this one person is the only person for you, your twin flames, and no one else will ever be able to fill that spot in your life. Because of my scarcity mindset, even when guys were treating me like a jerk, I never thought I'd be able to find somebody else. And it kept me stuck in relationships with guys who made me feel anxious because I could tell they didn't have that same level of excitement of like wanting to talk to me on a daily basis. Stuck in relationships with guys who would purposefully try to make me feel jealous by making little jab comments right in front of me about how cute other girls were. Well. Welcome to the other half, where we know attraction is not just about looks. We also have to take care of the inner half. 
because back then, when those guys were trying to make me feel insecure about the way that I looked or the way that I was showing up in the relationship by pointing out all the other hotties around, it totally worked. It made me feel like I wasn't good enough. I had to try harder. I had to be hotter. Well, guess what? These days, I would never go out with a guy who was making it a point to check out other girls right in front of me. I'd be like, yeah, okay, boss. You want a hot girl? Have fun. Go get you one. People who love and care more are more valuable in relationships and don't let anybody try to trick you into thinking it's the other way around. I challenge you to make your self-development the goal and let go of wanting to control the outcomes or trying to predict this perfect future and instead focus on the direction that you would like to go. Build that confidence and trust in yourself and keep your list of boundaries on you as a guide that you can continuously refer back to. So if the day comes where you do start to feel a little confused and like you're about to get knocked off of your path, don't panic, pivot. If this video helped you, so will this one. My name is Maria Adriana. You did not have to live my life, but I certainly hope you can learn something from it. As always, thank you for visiting. The other half.